Fritz, what is the Illuminati? Explain in brief, if you will, what is the Illuminati, who is the Illuminati, and what is their prime objective? The Illuminati are the powerful bloodlines that have controlled the globe. Uh, they go back to Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt, and they have quietly persisted throughout the centuries. And you can trace some of their genealogies. Some of their genealogies are hidden. Uh, one of the things that I've done in my Bloodlines of the Illuminati book is show some of the genealogies and show how some of these bloodlines go way back. So there, uh, some people call them uh, the powers that be, but they're not the entire um, structure that's controlling things. They're the string pullers, um, and they also have their own religion, which is Gnosticism, and they're generational. Um, so, if you're born, in, if if you're born into an Illuminati family, you may or may not actually become a member, um, and you may or may not become a hierarchy member. So. Uh, uh, you know, but uh, it, it's generational. And um, really, after working with people that had come, at, that were trying to come out of the Illuminati that I was trying to help uh, and getting to understand the rituals that they performed, uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that these are generational satanic families. Right. What is the modus operandi of the Illuminati? How do they operate? How do they normally infiltrate an organization, an institution? How do they go about doing that? Well, you know, people that are coming into this whole subject uh, relatively new, let's say they, they were introduced to the whole subject six months ago or a year or maybe two years ago, they're thinking, when did the Illuminati take control? But the actual uh, reality of it all is they are the ones that have constructed our world system of systems. So our educational system, our pharmaceutical system, um, the, the medical uh, health industry, uh, all these different uh, th things, like the market, you know, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, exchanges around the world, all these various systems were created by them. So it's not so much a, a, and the, the cons. It, it's it's really not the concept that they have infiltrated and hijacked these. They created them, and one of the things I wanted to discuss today, which we had talked about discussing, was the apostasy in the churches. And uh, when we, getting back to your, this pertains to your question, you know, if you start looking at all these different religious groups, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, the LDS Mormons, the Primitive Methodists, the Adventists, um, Moravians, and you just start going down a long list of of denominations, Christian groups, you'll see that Freemasons, a lot of times Freemasons that connect back in to the Illuminati, created these organizations. Like uh, Joseph Smith Jr., who created the LDS Mormons, he was of this Illuminati bloodline, and all of the leadership, the they call them prophets, they're presidents of the LDS Church, have been of the same bloodline, and they all go back to this Illuminati bloodline. Charles Taze Russell, who started the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witnesses, he was of the Russell Illuminati family. So, it is, so the question is not when did the when did the Illuminati subvert the Mormons or the the or when did they infiltrate and subvert 
the Jehovah's Witnesses, the reality is, is they were the ones that created these organizations. Right, yes. And the, the, the topic of this interview is the Illuminati infiltration into Christendom, we can say, more specifically into churches, uh, into Protestant churches. And that's why I was asking what, what for, for people who uh, aren't familiar with the Illuminati or how they operate, uh, it's important uh, that you said what you said because now they'll have a better idea of how they infiltrate churches and why. And that brings me to the to again to the the primary topic here. There's a movement happening. Uh, two two movements are happening simultaneously, and both of these movements movements are being influenced and be, actually have ha, were started by uh, the global elite, the Illuminati these ruling families, these ruling factions. And the two movements are ecumenism and the interfaith movement. Ecumenism is uh, basically an amalgamation of all the Christian denominations, including the Catholic Church, together. So it amalgamates, ecumenism seeks to amalgamate or to fuse all of the different denominations together under the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, it's it's really like all the Protestant little churches come, going home to the mother hen, the little Protestant chicks going home to the mother hen, which is the Catholic Church. There's there's a very strong ecumenism movement or ecumenical movement happening right now, and then there's a very strong interfaith movement happening. And the two kind of entwine. The interfaith movement is a movement that is seeking to amalgamate all the religions of the earth uh, under one banner. And uh, that's the ultimate goal. And I know you know, Fritz, that the Illuminati are seeking not only a one-world uh, political structure, but also a one-world religious structure. And uh, so we're, they're moving, they're, they're funding, um, and we, we'll get into this in a little bit. They're actually funding and have been funding for years certain movements within the Protestant churches uh, moving towards a one, ultimately a one world religion. Is that a, is that an accurate assessment? Yes. The Illuminati have had on their agenda the creation of a one world religion. JP Morgan, who became an Illuminati member late in the uh, 1800s, after he had become an Illuminati member, he uh, started supporting an ecumenical movement to unite all of the Christian churches. And under his tutelage, um, financed by him, they created the Federal Council of Churches of Christ. It was called the FCCC. And um, the leadership of the FCCC were Freemasons. And, um, by the way, Charles Taze Russell, who had started the Jehovah's Witnesses, you may be a little bit surprised, but he was like one of the first people that started supporting, uh, this ecumenical movement by, uh, J.P. Morgan to unite the Christian churches. The strange thing of it was as though he verbalized in his talks around the world, support for this, the Watchtower Society itself never uh, publicly joined the FCCC. The FCCC then, it, it transformed itself into the National Council of Churches. Notice that they dropped off the, the word Christ. And um, again, uh, the National Council of Churches its leadership were Freemasons, and Freemasonry uh, is like the glove. Uh, if, if the Illuminati's the hidden hand that's controlling things, Freemasonry's like the glove to it. And so, again, we see high-ranking Freemasons um, like G. Uh, Oxum Bromley, who was a 33rd degree Freemason. He was uh, one of the leaders of the FCC, NCC, and, and then later the World Council of Churches. Um, so he was the first president of the World Council of Churches. So 
after we got the National Council of Churches, then the next step was to create the World Council of Churches. And you see in, uh, I believe it was 1982, in Sweden, the World Council of Churches pledged themselves to support, actively support a one world government and a one world church. And, uh, Billy Graham has been very active in the World Council of Churches. Now, when Billy Graham first got started, um, and he was asked about the World Council of Churches back in the early fifties, he made the comment, that he felt like they probably were uh selecting the Antichrist. But by the late 50s, he was actively participating in it. And in fact, uh, you know, I pulled out some stuff here. I don't know if you'll be able to see it there. But here's Billy Graham in uh the New Delhi. This is the 1961 World Council of Churches meeting. And that's Billy Graham there at that meeting, and um, he became the leading uh, advocate around the world for ecumenicalism. Uh, he himself is a 33rd degree Freemason, and uh, this is, this is a, a book, The Clergy and the Craft, written by uh, Reverend Haggard, who's also a Freemason. And uh, in here, in his book uh, on, on Freemasonry, uh, he quotes Billy Graham. And uh, Billy Graham, and, and uh, when I read this book, I noticed that everybody in here that he quotes is, are Freemasons, right? But the, the Masonic Lodges kept Billy Graham's uh, membership secret, although some Freemasons, not knowing who I was, have told me, gloated and bragged that Billy Graham was a Freemason. In fact, I talked with Jim Shaw, who's the highest ranking Freemason to defect f from Freemasonry. He is a 33rd degree Freemason, and he left, he, he, he gave his life to Christ and left Freemasonry. And I talked with him on a number of occasions. Billy Graham was at his 33rd degree initiation ceremony in Washington, D.C., and uh although I don't have it here to to show to you but I mean uh I can I can just simply say what it says the Scottish Rite magazine that I I have boxes of of masonic literature and books and magazines and in one of them it talked about the 33rd degree initiation ceremony and how only 33rd degree freemasons are allowed to attend so the fact that Billy Graham was attending his initiation ceremony, his 33rd degree initiation ceremony shows that Billy Graham himself is a 33rd degree Freemason. And here in this book by this Freemason, they quote uh, Billy Graham. They say, Dr. Billy Graham said, uh, and he's talking about the Order of Demolays, which is the Masonic order for young people. He's saying, um, there are the young people upon which the hope of America's future rests and Demolays are part of this group. May God richly bless all Demolays as they continue their good work. So there's Billy Graham uh, uh, bragging or saying that God's work is going to be done by the Order of Demolay, which, uh, you know, is named after Jock Demolay, who was the head of the, um, the Knights Templars, which, you know, Jock Demolay, was was killed on Friday the 13th. It was kind of interesting here in 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 Portland. They have a, a the Billy Graham people. This is the Billy Graham Crusade here. You see the Billy Graham Crusade people. They gave out this this certificate for women. And when is it redeemed? Friday the 13th. I just thought it was really coincidence that uh you know. Jock D. Malay, who was killed on Friday the 13th. Um, and then they, they give this, the Billy Graham crusade gives the certificate that's, that can be redeemed that day. Interesting. But anyway, uh, there's, there's three major, 
I, I, there, there's many more, but three major Christian clergymen come to my mind that are, are very powerful in America that are 33rd degree Freemasons. You have Norman Vincent Peale, who is a 33rd degree Freemason. You had Robert Schuller, who is a 33rd degree Freemason, and Billy Graham, who is a 33rd degree Freemason. And all of those men have promoted this ecumenicalism, especially Billy Graham, and he's he he's been very active in the World Council of Churches. Now, if we go back and and look, who are the members? Who are the leadership of the World Council of Churches? You you see people that are are diametrically opposed. They're apostates. They're, these are people that um, are Communist Party members that are high-ranking Freemasons, socialists, you know, Illuminati members. We're, we're looking at we're looking at something that's that's diametrically opposed to Christ, and um, the the convergence uh, needs to include the Catholic Church. So you know, you'll notice that uh, Billy Graham is very uh, um what what's the word I'm looking for he's he's very active with the Catholic Church you know he got his honorary doctorate here's the Catholic Church um bestowing this on him and the uh and and, and then this is a newspaper article here where the archbishop endorses Billy Graham and I know that uh his crusade doesn't tell the truth because Billy Graham has been very active in supporting the Catholic Church. Like when he went to Poland and he did his crusade, if you came forward, you were sent to a Catholic Church. And um, another time he went to uh, Poland, uh, he uh, spoke in Catholic churches, and he told them that they were already Christians. He didn't say that they needed Christ or salvation. He was saying, "You are, you already have Christ. You're already Christians." In other words, here's a here's somebody who's a Protestant acknowledging the Catholics as being a, a totally okay. And um, this is this is what ecumenicalism is about: is the merging of all these different churches. Why was there a Reformation? People need to ask themselves why. Did why did a Reformation occur? Why was the Catholic Church's power challenged, and what were the issues there? Now, I'm not saying that the Protestants are are uh, uh, don't have problems. Um, in fact, talking about ecumenicalism, one of the things that uh, I I did. Talking about, and and this is just, I came out with a list of 200 high-ranking Vatican officials who were Freemasons. I gave their secret initiation dates, their secret membership numbers, their uh, uh, secret Masonic names. There were two men that died to get that information. Anyway, I also went through on the... The Protestants don't look any better when it when when you talk about Freemasonry. And these are some pages from my Be Wise the Serpents book. And here you can see I go denomination by denomination and give ministers that are Freemasons: American Baptist, General Baptist, Baptist, Missionary Baptist, National Baptist, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist. You know, Southern Baptist is the largest denomination within the Protestants, and 65% of their ministers are Freemasons. And years ago, some of my friends were trying to get the Southern Baptist Convention to say that Freemasonry is incompatible with Christianity, and the Southern Baptist Convention would not, would not back them. So here's some more of these lists of Freemasons, uh, Ministers, Christian Church, Church of God, Church of Scotland, Congregational, 
Disciples of Christ, Episcopalian. Uh, when, it, when we talk about the Episcopalian Church, that's really just a, a heretic branch of the Catholic Church. You, it, the Church of England broke off of the Catholic Church. Part of the reason why was is the king wanted to be able to divorce his wife, and um, he was beheading several of them uh, because he he couldn't find a wife that would produce a sire. And uh, so he, he wanted permission to divorce his wife. The Pope said no. So he deposed the Archbishop of Canterbury and put in his own uh, person. And that caused a split with the Catholic Church. There were also some other issues, but uh, that was the major issue. So when we talk about the Church of England, they also call that church the Anglican Church. But since the American Revolution... It wasn't very popular to refer to, uh, I'm going to the Church of England after our revolution. So they, they started calling it the Episcopalian Church. But the Episcopalian Church, the Archbishop of Can Canterbury, who's the head of it, has typically been a Freemason. And, uh, so here we go, Methodist Episcopal, Evangelical, Friends, Jewish Rabbis, Lutherans, Methodists. Uh, we just go down, you know, uh, Presbyterians, United Presbyterians, Reformed Church, uh, Salvation Army, Unitarian, United Brethren, uh, United Church of Christ, Universe. You, you, you go through Freemasonry has, has members throughout Christendom. <laughs> throughout that, Christendom. That brings me to a question, Fritz. Um, I have a lot of questions from, from all that information you just covered, but, but I know that in the past, I can't, uh, reference the date, but I know that in the past or the time frame, the Vatican at least feigned to be at war with the Masons. In fact, uh, the Jesuits were the adversaries of the Masons for a time. But now I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, but something had happened within the Vatican uh, some years back to where there was either some kind of a Masonic takeover or an Illuminati infiltration that changed all of that. What is the relationship at this point in time between the Vatican and the Illuminati slash Masons? Good question. What is the relationship between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry? You know, typically over the last few centuries, uh, people have been told that there's this huge war going on between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry. Now, going back to an earlier question that you had asked, how does the Illuminati operate? Well, one of their major tactics is to use controlled conflict. It's called Hegelian dialectics. They'll, they'll create a thesis, an antithesis, and a synthesis. So this whole thing between Freemasonry and the Catholic Church, or going back even before that, we have the Knights Templars in the Catholic Church, is really a controlled conflict. Now, one of the things that I did in my Be Wise as Serpents book was I discussed how there were powerful families. You look at the Medici's, Visconti, Solve, they have provided popes. Now, they not, they not only have provided family members that became popes, but they have a actually, these powerful families have controlled the Catholic Church from behind the scenes. Now, uh, the Jesuits got created, and when they were created, they were called the Order of the Illuminati, and Ignatius, as you probably know, or some of our, our uh, viewers or listeners know, uh, created the, um, the, the Jesuits, the Order of Jesus. And um, then in 1733, the Pope at that time decided, no, the, the Jesuits are out of control. They're trying to take over things. They've got an agenda that's not, not Catholic. 
and the the Pope outlawed the order of Jesuits. Well, how did the Jesuits survive? Well, this is a page taken from a book of mine that I have not actually published. It's an unpublished book of mine. But this is Frederick the Great here. The the man over here on the other side is is a Jesuit named Carroll who provided the land. He gave the land that Washington, D.C. is now on. But uh, the head of Freemasonry at that time was Frederick the Great, and he's the one that got the Scottish Rite introduced into America, and they started the, the Scottish Rite um, in uh, South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina became the center of uh, the Scottish Rite at the time. Anyway, Frederick the Great was the one that saved the Jesuits. The head of Freemasonry saved the Jesuit order by giving them asylum from the Pope who had outlawed them. And so nothing's as it seems. We have a controlled conflict. When you start looking at things behind the surface, you start seeing that, that Freemasonry and the Catholic Church come together at the top, and the, the controlling thing between both of them is the Illuminati. The Illuminati send out instructions to the Pope as well as the Protestantism, uh, through the United Grand Lodge in London, I know that I know that as a fact. They send out um, instructions to both factions, and so there are many ways that you can start seeing uh, these kind, of, uh, seeing the the reality behind the smoke screens. This is Masonic jewelry, their badges, and so forth. This is a a catalog where you can buy, if you're a Freemason, you can buy uh, your your badges and your rings and stuff. Here are your badges, your rings. Okay, now let's see. Coming up here, it says 32nd degree Scottish Rite, and it's got all your rings for the 32nd degree here in the catalog. But you go to the next page, it's the Knights of Columbus. The, the 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 Catholic uh, fraternal organization. You get your you go to the same place to get your badges and stuff. Whether you're in the the Knights of Columbus as a Catholic, uh, and and actually, when I started researching these organizations, I discovered that on Washington's birthday, and Washington was a Freemason, on Washington's birthday in 1967. The heads of the Knights of Columbus and the heads of Freemasonry got together the, uh, the 33rd degree Scottish Rite. They got together and they had a high level meeting. How can we collaborate and work together? So all this thing about the Catholic Church and Freemasonry, uh, fighting this massive war. Sure, there's been a war, but it's been a controlled conflict. And uh, I have a lot of Masonic magazines, and you can go back. Uh, I I don't have them here to show, but I, I can quote them. And uh, this one Masonic magazine from 1919 talks about how Freemasonry is a world power and that they need to take their power as a world power and use it to control the world to create a one world government and a one world religion. This is in a, this is in the, the Scottish Rites magazine back then was called the New Age magazine. And, um, and so they talk about Freemasonry being a world power, but they say that the other world power is the Catholic Church and that they need to, uh, over, overpower the Catholic Church. So it was at, at that time, in 1919, there was this uh, controlled conflict between the Catholic Church and Freemasonry. But by the by 1967, you see the leadership of both groups getting together and collaborating. How can we work together on on um, a similar agenda? You know, <laughs> and then you look at my list of 200 leading. 
uh, Vatican officials and, and that they're Freemasons, you know. So, uh. So you may have, uh, in the lower levels of Freemasonry and the lower levels of the Jesuit order and the different orders within the Catholic Church, you may have those factions, individuals involved in those factions who actually believe there is conflict between for example, if you're a Mason between your organization and the Knights of Columbus. And they probably allow that to, to occur. They probably foster some of that conflict. But at the top, what you're saying is at the top, it's amalgamated. It's, it's the same team at the top of the pyramid. Right. And let's look at one item of their agenda. If you get into looking at what some of the Jesuit priests are advocating, they advocate what's called liberation theology. Okay, we discussed earlier about the World Council of Churches. Well, at the very same meeting in Sweden where they talked about that they were going to advocate for a one world government, one world religion, they also said that they were going to support a liberation theology. And uh, I made a note to myself, I had because I knew I would, we were going to talk about these kind of subjects. I made a note to myself: the World Council of Churches they gave a hundred and fifty-eight thousand dollars to North Vietnam during the Vietnam War. They gave seven hundred and forty thousand dollars to SWAPO, which was a communist uh, guerrilla organization in Africa. And then the ANC, which was a guerrilla organization in South Africa, which was fighting against apartheid back then. This we're talking about in the 1980s. They gave $362,000 to those guerrillas to help them in their guerrilla war. So they started funding, liber the World Council of Churches started funding liberation gr uh, theology guerrillas in Central America and in Africa that were fighting uh, wars, guerrilla wars, which, you know, that was like the precursor to uh, terrorist groups that we have today. And uh, and what, what do you think the purpose was behind them funding these, these different uh, sectarian organizations? Well, it's interesting that you have both the Jesuits and the Freemasons uh, which were both be, uh, both active in the World Council of Churches, all three of these organizations, Freemasons, Jesuits, World Council of Churches, are funding liberation theology or libera uh, these guerrilla movements around the world. It, it goes back to another thing that is, is an Illuminati uh, saying, order out of chaos, ordo ob chaos. You'll see that. You'll see that uh, little slogan written in a lot of places. And um, in other words, going right back to controlled conflict, by having the this chaos, they have the, their the controllers come in and work an agenda. It's uh, it, it's the thesis, antithesis, and the synthesis. So to see how this worked is. You know, you have World War One, and out of World War One, which was a controlled conflict, you have the League of Nations. You have World War Two, which was a controlled conflict, and out of it, you have the United Nations. And then, the what had been originally planned, but now I think that they may have backed off and and changed their agenda some. But they had originally planned a third world war, which was centered in the Middle East, which would then bring in their, their new world order, world government on a visible, uh, um, level. They already have world government. Um, but the, to bring it in visibly where we ask them to bring it in is, is another thing. And so going back, to um, J.P. Morgan, remember I talked about how he was Illuminati, and he he funded the FCCC, the Federal Council of, uh, of Churches of Christ. Well, the Federal Council of Churches of Christ 
was calling for a League of Nations before World War I. Before. And then because World War I took place, then people said, well, we definitely need this League of Nations. So you can see them bringing in their agenda. Now, going back to the National Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches and how they integrate in with the Illuminati, John Foster Dulles, whose brother Alan Dulles was head of the, he was, he was a prominent in the OSS as well as then the, the, uh, CIA, which was created f after the OSS was terminated, the, it, it picked up again as the CIA, and Alan Dulles was the DCI, the head of, of it. And his brother, John Foster Dulles, was the secretary of the FCCC, and he was very important also in, in the National Council of Churches, and also in the World Council of Churches. So where I'm going with this is, is the CIA and the Illuminati were very active in all of those, those ecumenical organizations. And how does this, how does this affect us on the local level? Well, you, uh, I'll give you an example. You know, let's say you have this little, uh, Church of Christ out here. And this little Church of Christ says, we are the true believers because we believe that you're saved by baptism and we don't believe in musical instruments. And all these other churches believe in musical instruments. That, uh, you know, we don't believe in the Catholic Church and you're saved by your, your water baptism. Okay. Well, uh, people that aren't into that would say, well, that's really cultish, you know. But the thing of it is, is when you have someone like the Billy Graham come here, every church in southern Washington and northern Oregon supported the Billy Graham crusade, even churches of Christ like that. And here they are supporting basically an ecumenical movement because the Catholic Church was very active in the Billy Graham crusade here in Portland. Now, because I was trying to expose the Billy Graham crusade and the ecumenicalism of it, uh, I and someone else, we confronted the Billy Graham crusade staff. They said, you're going to send, we said, you are going to send people to Catholic churches that come forward in your crusade here in Portland. And they, they lied right to our face. We got it on tape recorder. We, we taped it. They said, no, we will not send people forward or we will not send people to Catholic churches that come forward at the crusade, right? That's what they told us. We taped it. The very next day we were listening to the Catholic radio station here in Portland and the archbishop was on radio talking to the Catholic listeners and he said, Billy Graham has confirmed personally with me that Anybody who goes forward that's got a Catholic background is going to be sent, uh, referred to Catholic churches. So right there, the very next day, we heard proof that the Billy Graham crusade people had lied to us. But what's interesting is, is here all of these little denominations that would have nothing to do with the Catholic church are, are, are you know, joining it and, and all other kinds of churches. Like I say, there was only... There was only one church in all of Southern Washington and and uh, Northern Port and uh, Northern Oregon that didn't participate in the Billy Graham, Graham Crusade. Only one church. So talk about ecumenicalism. Yeah, that's been a policy. That's been a policy of the Billy Graham Crusades for for at least fifty years. Because I have a quote here from nineteen fifty two in an interview with the Pittsburgh Sun Telegraph. Billy Graham said, many of the people who reach a decision for Christ at our meetings have joined the Catholic Church, and we have received commendations from Catholic publications for the revived interest in their church following our campaigns. This, this happened both in Boston and Washington. After all, one of our prime purposes 
is to help the churches in a community. If after we move on, the local churches do not feel the efforts of these meetings in increased membership and attendance, then our crusade would have to be considered a failure. Then in 1957, he said in an interview with the San Francisco News, he said, anyone who makes a decision at our meetings is seen later and referred to a local clergyman, Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish. So basically what Billy Graham is saying in these statements that he made publicly to the press is that he considers the Catholic Church, Roman Catholicism, to be a legitimate part of the body of Christ. He also considers, according to this statement, or at least we can derive from this statement, that he believes that the traditional Jewish faith, which rejects Jesus, somehow is also a part of the body of Christ because he's fine with sending converts to uh, Jewish synagogues. If I'm reading that, if that, if I'm reading that, if I'm interpreting that quote correctly. Yes. So, there's a, so that's, that's where this is really heading towards. And people, of course, will come out and say that the, the great argument that people have and the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the primary problem that, that, that people run into, that Christians run, run into with these guys is they say, but so and so got saved in their ministry. Or I know a person who went and received Jesus who accepted Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. Or, uh, these people are having a, a, a very, uh, wide effect on the world, a very, uh, significant effect on the world for the gospel. But the problem is that you cannot measure, uh, where a man stands biblically according to the effect that they're having in the world. You can't uh, ascertain if what is being preached is the true gospel of Jesus Christ according to unity and peace. After all, in the uh, last days, the, the, the book of Revelation says that people will be saying peace and safety before destruction comes. But, so the Antichrist is bringing peace and safety for a season. And so people automatically, because there was some fruit or because somebody gave their lives to Jesus or because the churches are, are gaining membership or something like that, they will base uh, the validity of people's ministries based on those quote-unquote fruits rather than... than uh, rather than, than defining those ministries according to the gospel of Jesus Christ as preached by Jesus Christ himself and by his disciples and the, the apostles. People have gotten away from defining truth according to scripture. That's part of this. I, I believe that's part of the ploy. That's part of the deception. That's part of the goal is first to get Christians to drop the biblical standard of what it means to be a servant of Jesus Christ, which is a, the declaration that Peter had, that you are the Messiah, referring to Jesus, the Son of the living God. And furthermore, those who make that declaration in faith then begin to live their lives according to the Scriptures, according to the teachings of Jesus and according to the Scriptures. That's the foundation of our faith. That's what ought to... Uh, that's what joins us together. That's what causes us to be a family. It's not peace and safety and church membership and this very general uh, ad uh, adhesion to Christianity. And that's where this is all going. So people are willing to drop those fundamental uh, foundations. People are willing to compromise on, on, on the gospel of Jesus Christ and on the scriptures in order to participate in a broader Christian family. And it's very beguiling, isn't it, Fritz? It's very yes. beguiling because people feel like they're participating in a movement of unity for the body of Christ. But really what the, uh, what the Illuminists are doing is they know that in order to reach their goal of a one world religion, their greatest, I believe their greatest hindrance to a one world uh, government 
I mean religion, I should say, is fundamental Christianity, fundamental Christians. I believe fundamental, fundamental Christians are a greater hindrance to that movement, the one world religion, than fundamental, uh, than, than the fundamentalists in Islam. I think fundamental Christians are the number one target. So if they can get Christians who, whose faith is based on, on the Bible, the biblical tenets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, if they can get them to compromise on some of those foundational truths in order to participate in a universal Christian movement, and, and I believe there's something coming here that people are not prepared for, uh, I think many, many, many Christians are going to be swept up into this deception, into this ecumenical deception based on the idea of linking hands with the Catholic Church for the harvesting of souls. And that's really going to get people because they're going to say, well, it, well, aren't we supposed to be harvesting souls? How can the Vatican be wicked if their objective is to go out and win people for Christ? When really what's, what's, what's going to happen is they're going to bring people in to a form of godliness. They're going to bring people in to an apostate church. That's what that harvest will be. It will be a diminishing, a, an, an apostasy within the real church and an enlarging of the apostate church. That's part of the deception that's coming. And I see it happening, Fritz. I see it happening uh, in all of the uh, in all of the mainline Protestant churches. Um, obviously, you pointed out that there's been a Masonic infiltration for years in these organizations, and and I've got some data in front of me here from an article that cites even seventy to eighty percent of some of these organizations, denominations, I should say, uh, seventy to eighty percent of their leadership are Masons. And not not just low level masons. Some of these guys are, are 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 higher level masons and have been for years. I mean, so there's been an infiltration into every single denomination of the Christian Church. Obviously, the Vatican is uh, uh, is is the is the best example. But I don't consider the Vatican a Christian church. The uh, Roman Catholicism is rank apostasy. Has been since its co conception. So. Uh, I, I'm seeing this especially, and I, and I want to talk about, uh, for a moment, Fritz, the charismatic movement, because I see a lot of charismatic churches. I came out of a charismatic church, and I'm not against the charismatics, by the way, but I see a very interesting thing happening among the charismatic churches. There is this, there is this call for the harvesting of a billion souls right now. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, those who are familiar with God TV, God TV's the, the, the up and coming successor, we can say, of, of TBN, which TBN's still around, but God TV is, 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 is rising rapidly. And the whole idea is to harvest a billion souls. And it's very ecumenical. It's about linking arms with all these different denominations and, of course, with the Catholic Church. And so you have a lot of, uh, charismatic leaders who know who know, these men know, a lot of these leaders, that the Catholic Church does not believe in the fundamental tenets that really, that really the, the, the Reformation began, that, that really were the foundation for the beginning of the Reformation, which are sola scriptura, sola fide, and sola gratia. In other words, uh, scripture alone, faith alone, and grace alone. The Catholic Church categorically rejects that. That's not the doctrine of the Catholic Church, and yet a lot of these charismatic leaders will discard that. They're willing to compromise on that. They're willing to compromise on the, uh, uh, on the, on the fundamentals of the faith in order to harvest souls. So there's this, tr there's this deception that's already beginning to seep in, and, and uh, in fact, I believe a lot of it is based in occultism, of the uh, occultism from the 19th century, from the mid to late 19th century, theosophy and spiritualism that infiltrated the church and really found a home in the charismatic movement more than anything else. Yes, yeah, so I, I want to address that later when when you get done here. Sure, go ahead, address it now. Well, if you don't mind. The Illuminati trained people. I know this 
because you know I I spoke at length with one gentleman who was trained by the Illuminati to go into Christian churches and turn them to the new age, turn them to witchcraft. But see, Christians don't understand what witchcraft is all about. Uh, when when you're dealing with witchcraft, you got you can break it up in 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 two different ways. You can it, one way is it good witchcraft and bad witchcraft, right? Benevolent or or malevolent, and then you can have witchcraft that is visible or that is hidden. Okay, so when you take those those two different ways of breaking it up, if you were to make a box, you actually come up with four squares, right? So, um, if if you were talking about it being benevolent and visible, that would be like a Ouija board. But if you were talking about it being malevolent and visible, that would be like a voodoo doll. But if you're talking about it being hidden and positive, that's visualization. That's using willpower. That's using spiritual laws. So when these people like Robert Schuller and Norman Vincent Peale have come in to the churches and said, well, we're going to teach you how to use spiritual laws. We're going to teach you how to say this incantation, do this ritual or, or visualization and all of this. This is actually witchcraft. And if somebody were to go back and look at Adolf Hitler and what Adolf Hitler was constantly promoting, it was willpower. You know, his generals would come up and say, hey, we our, our troops don't have food. Our troops don't have any bullets. They're outnumbered. And Hitler's response consistently would be, if you just have the will, if you just have willpower, you can overcome it. That is magic. And, and so that's what they're teaching the Christians. The true prayer is a prayer of supplication of faith. It's not based on my faith, but it's faith in God. There's a big difference, but that's not being taught by the churches. So they have infiltrated the churches with witchcraft. They have infiltrated the churches with Masonic thoughts, Masonic thinking, and, and like you were saying, theosophy. Um, and, and, uh, I think it's important uh, for us, if I can interrupt your flow here, I wanted to take us back to the listeners to, to think about what is apostasy. Cause we've been talking about apostasy. Listeners need to understand apostasy is both not believing the important fundamental doctrines, but also not doing the important things. So uh, going back to some of the things that you were talking about, they need to understand that that Christ was born of a virgin. Why? Why would it be Im important that he was born of a virgin? Because he had to have been uh, born through the Holy Spirit to be something special. If you as a man died for my sins, you don't have, your blood doesn't, isn't special. You can't blood, die for my sins. You know, Christ had to be someone special. His blood had to be special, so special that in shedding it, he paid the price for all of humanity. Exactly. So that virgin birth is very important, but these uh, Bible translations that are called satanic Bible uh, uh, translations or perversions, which the modern churches are using, they have erased the virgin birth out, you know. Uh, so there are some fundamental uh, doctrines like the resurrection of Christ that are very important. Going back, you know, I talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses. And a lot of people would think that I'm splitting hairs. But the Bible talks about the resurrection of Christ, and the resurrection of Christ is a foundation of hope for us. If Christ was not resurrected, then we're, we're, our religion or our faith is lame. Exactly. And so the resurrection is an extremely important thing. Now, you look at the Jehovah's Witnesses. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses believe? Well, they believe that God will remember who we were and recreate us. 
But First Corinthians more than talks any other men on the about earth. how something says. of us, and as you know, just one little single cell from your body has all the DNA plans to create who you are. It says in the in the scriptures that God's going to take something of each of our physical bodies as a seed to our our resurrected spiritual bodies. So there's going to be some some little seed continuity between the two. It's not a recreation, it's a resurrection. There's a big difference there, but but uh the Jehovah's Witnesses think that, <coughs> excuse me, that God's merely going to recreate you. Well, see, these little things are major. They may seem like they're not important, but they're major. Um, you know, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, no man comes to the Father except through me. So if we <coughs> accept <coughs> the World Council of Churches and their mission to bring in all these other religions, all these other ways, if there's another way to the Father, like Billy Graham is saying, there's another way to the Father because you can be Jewish and, and be saved. If there's another way to the Father except be, besides Christ, then we're making Christ out to be a liar. Well, what kind of a savior is is Christ if he if he's going around lying? You know, he, he's obviously egotistical and prideful if he's saying I'm the only way, but he's not the only way. So these are fundamentals, and apostasy is when we don't believe in those fundamentals and we don't do the fundamental things. What does it say? Are are it says, love not the world, you know, or the things in the world. So if we go about loving the world, and obviously Billy Graham loves the world. I watched him on, on television one time talking about, I think he said, if I remember the number, it was 119 games of golf he's played with Richard Nixon. And I thought to myself, what? How much time do, and, and energy does it take to play over a hundred games of golf with R Richard Nixon, not to mention all the other presidents that he's hobnobbed with. It well, was, yeah, it takes it takes it takes a lot of time to develop the kind of relationships that a man like Billy Graham has with Bill Clinton and with a bunch of other people who are well-known illuminists. And really, you don't develop those kind of relationships with those men unless you are part of the Brotherhood. You don't you don't just walk into to that kind of relationship. You don't walk into that kind of an atmosphere and rub shoulders with those kinds of guys. Not just rub sho shoulders. Have these these intimate, friendly relationships when you're adhering and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They reject the gospel. They abhor the gospel. They are very much consciously worshiping Lucifer. They have no confusion in their minds about who their liege lord is and about who ours is if we declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. They hate Jesus. So it's like the Bible says, what relationship does light have with darkness? And I can understand a casual uh, uh, interaction with people. I mean, there's, there's Christians all over the world who are in high places who have interaction. Obviously, you're going to have interaction with all kinds of people. If you're a businessman, if you're a politician, but we're talking about intimate friendship. We're talking about intimate friendship. And that's, that, that, at the least, Fritz, that's, that's dangerous waters. You don't, you don't get in a, you don't get in the pool and swim with the sharks without getting bit, at, bitten at some point in time. I mean, uh, you, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of this going on and, and there's a lot of accounts and, and, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I personally know of someone who I can't, I can't go into the details, but I personally know of someone who was one of the Illuminati guys that would hand the checks to some of these Protestant preachers. And the idea is we're going to give you money, millions of dollars, whatever the, whatever the money is. And he also laundered money for them overseas. And we're talking about well-known Protestant preachers, some of the most famous guys, televangelists. And and so they get these checks from the Illuminati. 
And uh, John Todd talked about this, the Illuminati defector John Todd and many other people have come out and blown the whistle on this, that especially some of these mainline evangelical preachers are getting paid under the table exactly. by the Illuminists. And hey, the Timothy, reason why... Yes. Interrupting you, I have right here the proof of one of the things that you're talking about. This lady here, Alice Bramer, she was the secretary for Jean Dixon. Jean Dixon, here's one of her, she, one of her ads where she's, uh, um, talking about crystal balls. She was a new age, uh, prophetess, you know, and, um, Jean Dixon was her secretary and, or I mean, Alice Bramer was Jean Dixon's secretary. And in this letter, here that I have, she writes about how, you know, the elite would send Billy Graham a check through Gene Dixon. And, um, and, and here's a letter from Billy Graham praising Gene Dixon as a woman of God. Now, from, from a Christian perspective, somebody who's, who's doing what she did is, is, I'm verging on witchcraft, you know, using her crystal ball and to make her prophecies. But, but this, this is, this is exactly what you're talking about. He got a check from the Illuminati through Gene Dixon on a regular basis. And, um, and here's his letter to her, you know, um, you are indeed a woman of God, you know, and we do thank God for you. This is the way Billy Graham, in his letter, is talking to her. So, yeah, you know, you were saying you 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 knew of this firsthand, and you're right. This is the kind of stuff that I have had people tell me about. I was just fortunate to get the proof in this particular instance, because a lot of this is done under the table where it's hard to prove. So, Fritz, what are your thoughts on the infiltration of the Illuminati into the charismatic movement? Well, I'm going to preface my answer by saying we need to understand what the scriptures tell us about the, the, the end times. <clears throat> it says in Second Thessalonians that there would be this great apostasy before Christ would come back. You know, and Christ said, uh, when I return, will I even find anybody who has faith? And I, it was a sincere question because uh, it's going to be hard to find a man of faith, a true man of faith. And then when his disciples, which is recorded in Matthew 24, said, well, what will be the signs of your return? He said, there will be people that will come in my name. There will be all these false Christs and so forth. So we have to we have to take the what the the warning of the scripture to heart and realize that the scripture tells us that there's going to be a general apostasy. So don't become discouraged. Uh, I don't want the listeners to become discouraged and say, "Well, boy, if I believe what Fritz is saying, there aren't any good churches." Well, basically that's true. The the safest place is going to be, as far as spiritual nourishment, is going to be some small home church with dedicated uh, followers of Christ. If, you, if you're going to go to these 501c3 mainstream churches, you're going to be mixing with apostasy. And um, so taking that as, as um, an introduction, uh, let's look at this charismatic movement, which, as you were saying earlier, you know, uh, one of the, the litmus tests for it is how they view the, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, especially the Pope. And the charismatic movement, uh, has been very ecumenical. And, uh, you, you look at people like Benny Hinn, um, they're very, uh, pro-Catholic and there's a lot of interaction between, uh, people, uh, the, the, the big wigs of, of TBN and, uh, the Catholic Church. 
and I, you know, Benny Hinn is, is an example of, uh, a good example of Trinity Broadcast Network. You know, in 99, he was telling people, you're not going to survive the year 2000 unless you double your giving. And, um, in, in 1989, he's prophesying that there's going to be this huge earthquake that's going to wipe out the East Coast. You know, people need to ask themselves, well, what kind of man is this that's making all these false prophecies? And, you know, and he's got such a, supposedly got such a strong anointing and he, he warns his, his critics, don't touch the anointing, you know. Um, but, uh, I, I thought a good example, cause I thought you might ask about the, uh, about, the, uh, I thought you might ask this question about the charismatics. And so, um, I, I got a bio, biography information on one of the ministers that I think shows how it all connects. Reverend E.V. Hill, he, uh, he went to, um, there in Tulsa. He, he was, um, uh, the, uh, what was the, <laughs> the name of the, the school there in Tulsa, um, that, uh, he got his, uh, ministry from Oral Roberts University. That's what I'm trying to say. And he's been active in TBN. He's a board member of TBN. He's also a board member of the Billy Graham Crusade, and he's spoken at the uh, Crusade conferences. And um, he's a promise keeper leader. And um, going back to Benny Hill, or I'm Benny Hinn, uh, when Benny Hinn had his 25-year celebration, the person who gave the invocation was E.B. Hill. So he's across the board. You see him. Uh, very active in Billy Graham's crusade. You see him very active in TBN with the charismatics, with the ecumenical movement. And, um, and then you also see people that, that have power and money like Nelson Hunt. He gave him a million dollar contribution to kick off the step program. And, um, and you see that Hill was very active. Working with Jimmy Swagger, Jim Baker, Re- Reverend Lyons, who, uh, was found guilty of racketeering. So this is, this is what we're dealing with here is one sloppy, gooey mess. Um, <coughs> and how would you, how do you separate it out? Well, you really don't. You like one of the things that, uh, E.B. Hill was involved with was he was very, uh, Active in Reverend Jesse Jackson's, uh, uh, presidential candidacy. Well, Reverend Jackson, you know, was out of Chicago, that theolog- Union Theological Seminary. If you go back and look at Union Theological Seminary, you start finding all kinds of Illuminati, Freemasons connected with that. You find the Rockefellers connected with that. Um, uh, uh, you know, in fact, uh, go on and on. So it all, he, he's an example of, that, uh, ties it all in together where, you know, and, and going back to, uh, the Illuminati, Jimmy Swaggart, uh, connects in with Illuminati mind control. And although I don't want to get into that subject, Billy Graham connects in with, with, uh, um, the use of mind controlled sexual slaves and, and there's, so there's a whole Oral Roberts University connects in with the programming of, of Illuminati mind controlled slaves. So there's a whole nother deeper level to all of this that, um, I don't want to get into, but you look at, uh, 700 Club and, and the guy who started it, uh, Pat Robertson, and and how his father was a senator. You look at Chuck Colson. You know he was the the uh, the right hand person for Richard Nixon. And so we've we've got people like John Foster Dulles, Chuck Chuck Colson, uh, Pat Robertson, um, 
and you see that they connect in with the with power and and you would it it would be nice if people would would make the connections that um that there's something going on here but uh, people don't but let me just say that uh the word occult means hidden and there's a, a verse in the in the scriptures that talks about how Satan comes as an angel of light. And if you think of of what what would an angel of light appear like, if all of a sudden you were an angel of light came into your room, you would be overwhelmed. I mean, this is this is an overwhelming creature. And it says that Satan is able to appear like an angel of light. So likewise, his ministers are able to appear as, as you know, people have told me that Billy Graham's an archangel. Um, these men are able to appear as very positive, good men. But I, I ask when I, peop- when I go out on speaking uh, engagements, I ask people, what is the most popular occupation for men in the Illuminati? And people are like, eh, like a lawyer, a politician, or something like that. No, it's not a politician. It's being a Christian minister. It's being a Christian minister because that's the best front. Because in the occult, you've got the exoteric and the esoteric. Exoteric is the external. Esoteric is the hidden. That's what occult means, is hidden. And so you have to, there's always a false front. That standard operating procedure is to have a false front in the occult. And so if you're going to have a false front, pick the best false front that you can, you could possibly have. Pretend that you're this great angel of light, great Christian minister and, and, and get your, your picture as man of the year and, um, all these other positive things said about you. And um, and then run whatever agenda you want behind that. Isn't it also true that um, uh, some of these people, not all of them, but definitely some of them, and we don't have to get into this in detail, I just wanted to mention it because you had mentioned it briefly, that they have altered, they have altars, what are re- referred to as altars, um, fragmented personalities that they can... Um, Let's say one evening they can be involved in a very demonic ritual having to do with the occult, Luciferianism, the Illuminati, whatever. And then the next day they could be standing on a stage in front of a conference, conference speaking from, uh, preaching from the Bible. And, uh, that for some of these guys, probably not for all of them, but definitely for some of them, the reason why there's no conflict in their mind is because their mind is fragmented. Part of them it associates with the the darker stuff with the occultic stuff and disassociates with the christian stuff but then the other part of them you could say their other personality associates with the christian stuff the pastoral role and disassociates with or perhaps doesn't even have knowledge of the occultic side is that a true statement very true in fact an example of that is billy graham he's a programmed multiple personality um, maybe I'll go into a little bit detail here. There was a man, David Hill. Uh, he, he was adopted by Joseph Bonanno, who was uh, one of the heads of the mafia. And Joseph Bonanno really, really loved him and adopted him like his own son. And um, David Hill was, uh, he was going to South America uh he made a, a whole bunch of trips to do drug deals. And one time when he, when he went there, he was up on the top of this mountain and he had what's called a mountaintop experience. He met Christ and he gave his life to Christ. And, and when God touched him, it totally changed his perspectives on everything. And then, then because he was a Freemason and he knew about the Illuminati and um, there's there's some crossover between the Mafian families and the Illuminati families. Anyway, he knew about the New World Order and the Illuminati. And Billy Graham would come around Christmas time to Joseph Bonanno's 
family uh, to to his house because Joseph Bonanno and Billy Graham were very close. And so David Hill, when he became a Christian, decided he would warn Billy Graham about the Illuminati and their agenda and and ask him to get out of all of that. And so he spent three days in a hotel room back east with Billy Graham, pouring his heart out, talking about how he had given his life to Christ, warning Billy Graham to come out of all of this and to quit associating with all of this. And at the end of three days, David Hill told me that Billy Graham told him that he he was captive of the Illuminati. They had him blackmailed. They had him, you know, by the Kahunas. He couldn't he couldn't leave there, and, and and he couldn't quit doing their agenda if he wanted to. Um, now David Hill decided that he was going to expose all of this, and he wrote a book, and he sent me a manuscript of what he was writing. And I'm really glad that he did because they killed him just shortly after that and his manuscript disappeared. Um, so I was, I was fortunate to know him for a while before he was killed. Um, but anyway, uh, he, it was David Hill that had looked me up and told me all of this. And, you know, other people besides him have given me similar things. There was this one. Christian minister in Oklahoma that I got to know. And all that he knew of himself was that he loved the Lord and, and, you know, he was a Christian minister. But he was a program multiple personality. And when his programming started to come apart and he got some deliverance, he discovered that there was another side to him, that he had alter personalities that were actually satanic priests that on Friday, the satanic part of him would be doing satanic rituals. On Sunday, he would be leading his church as a Christian. And he was horrified to realize that he had this other side to him. So, yes, this stuff definitely happens. And that, and that I think, clears up some of the confusion for people. How can these men be so duplicitous and double-minded? Well, it's because they are literally double-minded. The, the there is uh, again we don't have to go into detail into this but uh, but the Illuminati programming is so efficient that they can actually split your personalities again into disassociated persons that have no idea what the other personalities are involved in and it's important for people to understand that Fritz again we don't have to break that down uh, that you, you're on plenty of YouTube videos talking about that stuff people can look you up. Um, but it's important for people to understand that because if you don't understand that element, it's really difficult as a human being to imagine another human being able being able to live such a farce. It almost seems impossible, doesn't it? Yes. Until you add in the the Illuminati programming factor. If you add that piece of the puzzle in, it all comes together. So can you have a minister who is on Sunday morning, uh, let's say this, a minister who who Saturday night is involved in animal sacrifice, wearing a black hood, chanting some Luciferian incantation, and on the next Sunday morning, standing at a pulpit, preaching from the scriptures sincerely. Is that possible? The answer is yes. Yes. That is possible. You know, and I mentioned Robert Schuler being a 33rd degree Freemason. And a witness at Unity Village talked about how he had done, how Robert Schuler had led a Luciferian ritual. You know, and, and when we get into Freemasonry, you know, when I have interacted with Freemasons, uh, repeatedly they've just blatantly lied to my face as if I was an idiot. And um, this one Freemason who went to the church that I was a member of, when I was in his house, there was a magazine with Albert Pike's picture on it. And I mentioned, oh, Albert Pike, uh, uh, one of the leading Freemasons. And he said, what are you talking about? There's never been any Freemason by the name of Albert Pike. Here it is right there on his magazine, you know. And he just starts telling me a bunch of lies. Well, I have a brochure that I got from the Freemasons 
which which is for the profane people, us people, telling us that Albert Pike is not an important person, right? But the reason why I want to talk about Albert Pike is when you read his morals and dogma, he says that the energy behind the Masonic Lodge comes from Lucifer, and Albert Pike was a Luciferian. And so... Um, yes, the seething powers of Lucifer, exactly. I think, is exactly. So, oh, he so I have some, I have some quotes. Like when I was in high school in in debate class, we would read we would read quotes. So I wanted to read some quotes here because uh, Albert Pike, like like you and I just said, in his book Morals and Dogma, makes it very clear that Lucifer is the power behind Freemasonry, and that book Morals and Dogma. Is, has been given to every Mason when he got to be, when he became a 32nd degree Freemason. So when the Freemasons say that nobody looks at that book, well, if nobody looks at it, why do they give it out when you become a 32nd degree Freemason? Anyway, this is from a booklet by the Supreme Council of the, uh, of the world of the 33rd degree of Freemasonry. Um, in this booklet, in 1970, issued in 1976 on page 29. It says, General Pike is recognized as one of the greatest Masonic scholars, philosophers, and historians of all time. Among the outstanding works to his credit is the ritualistic development of the ancient and accepted Scottish Rite. Through his diversified activities and writings, he is known and revered by hundreds of thousands the world over. And then the same group uh, the Supreme Council 33rd degree in 1988 put out another booklet for Freemasons on page 23 and it goes, Albert Pike remains today an inspiration for Masons everywhere. His great book, Morals and Dogma, endures as the most complete exposition of Scottish Rite philosophy. He will always be remembered and revered as the master builder of the Scottish Rite. So, so here we have someone, the Pope, he was called the Pope of Freemasonry, saying that Lucifer is behind Freemasonry. And then we have people like Billy Graham, uh, uh, Robert Schuller, Norman Vincent Peale, the head of the, um, Shuley, uh, who was head of the, uh, Methodist Church. You have all of these, uh, leaders, uh, G. Oxum Bromley, who was head of the, World Council of Churches, who is a 33rd degree Freemason. You have all of these people, and and what are they involved with? Well, come on, people. Um, Encyclopedia Freemasonry by this high-level uh, Freemason, Arthur Edward Waite, on page uh, 1970 in his encyclopedia, he says, he says, Pike raised the Scottish Rite from a comparatively obscure position encompassed by many competitors to its present unrivaled state as a high-grade system of masonry. Dr. Fort Newton has said in his picturesque manner that Pike found masonry in a log cabin and left it in a temple. So, uh, you know, and one more quote, and, and, and because I want to, I want to, uh, let people realize the importance of when you find out that your church leadership are Freemasons, that's nothing trivial. You know, uh, the head of the, the Southern Baptist was a 32nd degree Freemason. It's no wonder that the Southern Baptist uh, refused to condemn Freemasonry. This is a quote from Anton LaVey in his book, The Satanic Rituals, page 78. And he wrote, Masonic orders have contained the most influential men in many governments and virtually every occult order has Masonic roots. Wow, that's powerful. It is. It is. You know, um, is it even possible for Christian ministers to rise to superstar status? especially televangelists without either the 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 backing of 
or the influence of the Illuminati? Is that even possible? No. And it's an interesting phenomenon because, you know, we have to be careful about using a, a painting with a broad brush because one of the phenomenons that's happened, you have some some church denominations like the Methodists that are real liberal, but uh, their ministers, to become a minister, a young man goes to their seminary. Okay, well, some of these denominations that are liberal you will actually have some sincere uh, Christian young men that want to become pastors that go to their seminary. Well, if you are a sincere, born-again Christian and you go to the seminary, they don't want you in charge of a big church. They're going to take the son of some Illuminati kingpin or some Masonic 32nd degree Freemason, they're going to want somebody who's a programmed multiple personality that they can control. They want those types to be in charge of these big churches. So the big churches will get these real liberal uh, Illuminati type graduates and the real born again, hardcore Christian young men, they'll be sent out way out into the boonies to some little, uh, tiny little rural church. So some of these churches in these liberal denominations way out in the boonies have always had really solid pastors. It, it's kind of a strange phenomenon that you can't generalize. There, there are some Methodist churches that have actually had good, consistently good ministers <laughs> in spite of the 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 whole denomination being liberal yeah uh you know the uh something that i've always understood is that there's a system that exists people really have to get this there's a system that exists that permeates all facets of human society that if you rise to a certain level, whether it be politics, whether it be media, whether it be religion, you're entering into the network, whether you want to or not. It's just because it's a ladder. And when you get to certain heights of those ladders, they're, they're owned. They're, they're not only infiltrated, they're just completely owned and they've been owned and taken over long ago by this shadowy group of elites. So, that pertains to Christianity. When you see a man, any man, any Christian leader that is applauded and that is universally endorsed, I shouldn't say universally, but that is, that is endorsed, has, has high recommendation from worldly institutions, that's a red flag. Because traditionally, the world hates the gospel of Jesus Christ. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. That's what Jesus, I mean, that's what Paul says. It's foolishness to the Greeks. The gospel's foolishness. The gospel is foolishness to the ruling order of this world and all of their acolytes. So when you see these organizations, when you see uh, the Rockefellers and the, and the Rothschilds and the different central organizations connected to the central banks funding campaigns, uh, funding crusades, funding ministries, red flag there's something wrong um, immediately um, when you see different uh, ministers that have backgrounds in uh, Masonic that have Masonic ties or that have even ties to the skull and bones or the other societies I have a friend I was talking to the other day a pastor in Queens New York who uh, told me a story about, and I can't remember off the top of my head this this minister's name. He's a po very popular, well-known minister who was coming to do a meeting in in New York, and and the idea was again to gather all the churches together, and they're going to do this meeting, and this guy was going to come. Well, this p pastor friend of mine, he blew the whistle on this guy because he found out that this man was skull and bones. And that doesn't register with a lot of people, but for any of us who know even anything about the Illuminati, 
Skull and Bones is one of the most famous Illuminati organizations where they glean, where they recruit and train some of their young, their young acolytes coming up to the, coming up to the university. I forget, Fritz, which university is Skull and Bones Yale. associated with? Yale. So, so he blew the whistle on this guy. Wait, wait a minute. This guy's Skull and Bones. And, and, and obviously for, for very few ministers or pastors or Christians, for very few of us will slam on the brakes when we hear that. Wait a minute. Hands off, right? That's toxic. We'll have nothing to do with it because we understand what relationship does light have with darkness. And when you talk about skull and bones, you're talking about deep, occultic, esoteric darkness. But then a lot of the people associated with this meeting uh, were questioning that. Well, who cares? What does it matter? So what that he was skull and bones? There's a disconnect. There's, And to me, it's in... It's not a minor thing. This isn't an insignificant, trivial thing, as you were saying. This is a major issue. This is a major issue that is literally that has literally hijacked the issue of the 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 Illuminati influence and infiltration into churches. What we're talking about here has hijacked whole movements and ministries. And it's not that they hijack these ministries and these movements and, and, you know, one day it's a normal church service and then the next day the Illuminati hijacks it and it's pentagrams and black hoods. That's not the way it works. They hijack these ministries and little by little, in small increments, in small doses, they begin to change the theology. And they begin to bump certain people up the ranks. They, they begin to fund certain people. Listen, especially when it comes to the charismatic movement, if you have a lot of money, you can become a famous prophet, evangelist, apostle. If you have a lot of money and you rub shoulders with the right people, you don't have to have an anointing. That's what people don't understand. When you get launched into stardom in the, in, in the Christian world, especially in the Protestant Christian world, when you get launched into stardom, it's usually not the Holy Spirit that's doing that. It's the network. It's it's the uh, it's the nexus at work. You've connected in. the The person has connected in. They've plugged into the nexus. Money's flowing. Influence is flowing. They're being pushed up the ranks, and they can preach Jesus all day long. All they have to do, like you were referring to earlier, is insert little fallacies. They can preach ninety eight percent truth, but then that two percent is a damning fallacy is a damnable lie that they insert in a in a little leaven a little leaven ruins the whole lump as Jesus said. Well, Timothy, yeah, there you you touched on a whole bunch of things that I could comment on. One is that I'll take the last one you mentioned leaven. It might even be a little bit more descriptive to call it a cancer. Um Christ called, referred to a little leaven leaven at the whole thing, but a little cancer kills the body, you know, because it just keeps growing. Um, one of the things that I notice, because I have been in all of these denominations, I have, uh, I have visited or, 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 or uh, visited, uh, or been a member of a number of different denominations, um, worked with different, uh, Christians. Um, and so I'm, and I, and I, did comparative study of of what the different re religious denominations believe. So I've looked at, at them very closely. And one of the things that bothers me is not just the the sense of apostasy, because some of these churches are actually will give lip service to the correct doctrines, but they don't give their their people that are in the pew anything of substance. I'll, I'll give an example. I went to a congregation, and this was a, a congregation of about 40 elderly, uh, no, maybe 50 elderly uh, Christians. They were, everybody in, in the in the congregation was white-haired, and I visited with a number of them, and, you know, they, I would talk for instance, with a couple, and they 
they would say, we've been Christians for 40 years, you know, and, and you know, and we've had, we've had all of these uh, anniversaries and everything. These were, these were old time Christians, but the minister that got up and preached, preached on John 316, the most, you know, basic of, of sermons. And the people just sat there like sheeple in the pews. But I'm, I'm using this as an example of how there's so much in the Bible that will, will, will help people in dealing with the problems, all of the problems that we face. But what these churches are doing in effect is it's like sending out a soldier without training or ammunition. And what's he going to do in a war if he's not given, given training, a gun, and ammunition? He's going to be killed. And that's what the, the Billy Graham crusade does. They know that the statistics of people that come forward, most of the people that come forward in the crusades are just making decisions for Christ. They're actually, you know, deciding, well, I'm going to give up cigarettes or something. There's only a small percentage of people that are giving their life to Christ for the first time. And then they know that of those people that give their life to Christ for the first time, the majority are going to fall away. And the same thing is happening in the churches. They're not giving people the, the training and the answers to deal with the complex issues that they're going to be confronted with in the world. And, and, you know, Christ has left us in the world. We have to face these issues. And unfortunately, that's the thing that concerns me even more than the fact that they're giving false doctrines is that they're not even giving people the ability, even if they, even if they do teach them, you know, that Christ was born of a virgin, they don't teach them how to deal with the issues that they're going to, they're going to, uh, deal, have to deal with when they go to school or when they go to their job. You know, part of the, uh, the issue that's going on here and that, that, that I've noticed for years, because I've been a Christian all my life, I've, I've seen and uh, have had contact with many different denominations and movements and, uh, especially the charismatic movement, which again, I want to say as a disclaimer, I'm not against the charismatic movement at all. I just know that on every level, and I want people to hear me, on every level of Christianity, starting at the Vatican, working all the way down to the, um, uh, through, through the uh, Protestant churches, all the way to the non-denominational ch- church, uh, non-denominational churches, every single level has been infiltrated. So I'm not here picking on one denomination. There is a universal infiltration. Uh, that's what we're talking about. But part of the problem here is that these campaigns, whether they be the Benny Hinn campaigns or the, or the, um, uh, Billy Graham campaigns, part of the strategy for it, I think, of the Illuminati is to harvest, purposefully harvest tears. To purposely go out and harvest tears so that you take a bunch of unconverted people and you mix them in with the real McCoy. You mix them in with the wheat. Because what happens is, again, Jesus said, a little leaven ruins the whole lump. But what does a lot of leaven do? If a little leaven ruins, or a little cancer is bad, but what if your entire body is riddled with cancer? A little bit of cancer, you can do a surgery and get it out. But if you've got cancer in every one of your major organs, I mean, you're, you're on, you're on a path to death. You're going to die. And that's re- that's a great analogy. I was just talking to my wife the other night using that very analogy. I, I told her, I said, you know, when you wake up to this, when people begin to wake up to this infiltration, again, on every level, when you wake up to this infiltration, at first you realize there's cancer. It's like getting a diagnose, uh, a diagnosis from a, a doctor. There's cancer. Okay. That's, that's a heart stopper. There's cancer. All right. That's your first awakening. There's cancer in the body. Now referring to the body of Christ. Okay. But then you get the second diagnosis, which is it's everywhere. It's malignant and it has metastasized throughout the entire body. Every one of your organs, including your, your skin and all your internal organs are infested with cancer. That's the reality, isn't it? That's where we are. 
this thing has been going for so long, all the way back to the 19th century with the uh, infiltration of uh, spiritualism and theosophy into the church and into church theology and, and the placing, the strategic placing of, of Illuminati funded leaders in the seminaries. It's been going on for so long that by now, at this point in time in history, 2014, the, the collective body of, of, of Protestant churches it, it, as a body has terminal cancer throughout the body. I think that's a fabulous analogy because that's the reality. How do you root it out at this point? It's, and it's like you said, the sa and I agree with you, Fritz, the safest place to be, and I've been saying this for years, the safest place to be as a believer is in a small group of believers, not in some rising superstar church, not in some church that's growing leaps and bounds every week because they're watering the gospel down, they're, they're seeker friendly, you know, they, they're, they're, they're bringing in tears, tears, tears. You know, the early church was, it was secret. They met behind closed doors in secret. In fact, it was so secret that, that the Romans were jealous because they were getting these uh, they were getting this feedback that these agape feasts is what they were called, the agape feast, the love feast that the Christians were having, uh, and that's what they called them, the Christians. The, the early church called, called themselves, referred to themselves as the people of the way. That's what they referred to themselves as, uh, uh, as in the way, the truth, and the life, the people of the way, the truth, and the life. And they referred to the, to the gospel, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus as the event. Say so they were the people of the way, and their creed, their belief was in the event. That was that. Was, Paul said, "I preach Christ crucified, buried, resurrected." That was Paul's message, and that was what the church was thriving on. And they were uh, behind closed doors, meeting in secret in these agape feasts. And the emperors, they, there's the I can't remember which emperor emperor it was, but the emperors of Rome were jealous. Of these, uh, uh, of these, uh, these agape feasts and the, in the leaders of Rome, a certain emperor for sure made a comment and the, and the leaders and the, and the aristocracy of Rome was so jealous because the Romans, it was common for the aristocracy to have these, uh, these, um, orgies basically. They would literally have orgies and, 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 you know, practice gluttony and, in, in every abominable thing, and they felt like they were being undone by these Christians who were having these amazing agape feasts, which they thought were debauchery fests like they were having because they were hearing word from them. Obviously, that's not what the church was doing. The church was, was being the church and, and uh, fellowshipping and, and growing in the, in the strength and, and grace of, of the Lord and, and, and comforting one another and doing everything that the church does. And the spirit was moving among them, and and that was the vibrance of the of the of the early church, and it was in secret. It was behind closed doors. It wasn't public faith. Public faith, in other words, Catholicism, because Catholic means universal. Public faith was an invention. It became popular through Catholicism when basically the state and the Roman Catholic Church merged, or the state and the Church of Rome merged and became the Roman Catholic Church. And so now what you have is you have all these pastors who their prime objective, literally their prime objective, is to grow their churches. That's the prime objective. Not to feed their sheep the gospel, not to prepare their people, not to, not to prepare their people for core reality, for the reality of, of, uh, uh, of the world in which they live and make sure that they're founded in the gospel. The prime objective now is to, is church growth. That's the prime objective. And you mentioned the 501c3. Why? Because churches are functioning as corporations. That's how they're functioning now. They're not functioning like the early church as fellowships. They're functioning now. In fact, they're designed, most churches, not all churches, are designed to operate as corporations, as organizations. And that to me, is uh has 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 made it really easy for the illuminati to infiltrate to have influence and to take over some of these ministries because literally the ministries themselves were actually designed after the organizations that the illuminati already run and so it was a natural integration so again getting back to the point that i was making 
The safest place for believers to be is in small groups where the pastor is literally giving his life, laying down his life for the sheep, where the pastor is, is, uh, where the leaders of the, of the, of the church, the fellowship or the assembly are devoted to the scripture, are devoted to the gospel, and where a true vibrant fellowship be among the members uh, exists because there's not because the element of of the of the money and of the fame and of becoming the biggest church in the city and having the best music and all this it's not there it's non existent in these small fellowships and what you'll usually find is because I know and the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because some of the finest leaders that I know some of the finest pastors that I know are pastors of home churches they have they don't have the ambition that the other pastors have and you know what in in many ways they're untouchable they're they can't be influenced by the system because they have nothing to do with it and so i'm glad you made that point fritz i just wanted to highlight that uh i'm absolutely absolutely in agreement for people who are wondering where do we go what do we look for i think my church has been influenced by the illuminati look for small fellowships Home churches are small fellowships that are tight, tightly knit, that have the gospel right, they're teaching the correct doctrines, and they are uh, locked into the scriptures. If people are interested in getting more information on this, um, my Be Wise of Serpents book goes into a lot of details about the infiltration and control of Christian, Christendom and uh People can also read my Bloodlines of the Illuminati book where I talk about how the foundations are funding these different churches. There's, there's, you know, we're just scratching the surface on a huge subject here, but there, there's more information if people want to get more details or the bigger picture and they can go to pintracks.com, P-E-N-T-R-A-C-K-S, Pin like you write with a pen, tracks like a bunny rabbit makes in the snow. Pintracks.com is my website, and you can get my books if you're interested in more information on these subjects. To illustrate the fruit of what this infiltration of the Illuminati, of the elite, of the, the let's just call it the Luciferian infiltration because that's what it is at the very top. What the fruit is of this Luciferian infiltration that's been happening for at least a hundred years? I think that's a I think that's a conservative estimate. At least a hundred years, there's been a Luciferian infiltration, um, a very strategic, purposeful infiltration into P Protestant churches. I have in my hands here an article written by Lauren Day, M.D. The title of the article is "How the New World Order is Using the Christian Churches and Their Pastors." To destroy Christianity. And I want to read the first paragraph here because uh, the author of this article, Lauren Day, cites an amazing poll that was taken in 1987. And I think it really illustrates what's happened. So I'm going to read from the article here. Over two decades ago, in the December 1987 Pulpit Helps, which reaches thousands of ministers, Frightening st statistics were published after being gathered by the Jeffrey Hayden survey. Questions were sent to some 10,000 Protestant clergymen. 7,441 replied. Pastors from many different denominations were surveyed. The questions, together with the percentages in the replies, are shown below. Some pastors in every denomination surveyed replied no to the following questions. The largest percentage answering no occurred among the Methodist pastors, followed by the United Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, American Baptists, American Lutherans, which the lowest percentage answering no, with the lowest percentage answering no, and the Missouri Synod Lutherans. Here's the questions. Do you accept Jesus' physical resurrection as a fact? No, was the response from 50% of Methodist pastors, varying down to 2% of Missouri Synod Lutherans. Do you believe in the virgin birth of Jesus? No, was the response from 60% of Methodists down to 5% of Missouri Synod Lutherans. Do you believe in evil demon power in the world today? 
62% of Methodist pastors said no, varying down to 2% of MS Lutherans. Do you believe that the scriptures are the inspired and inerrant word of God in faith, history, and secular matters? 87% of Methodists, 95% of Episcopalians, 82% of Presbyterians, 67% of American Baptists, 77% of American Lutherans, and 24% of Missouri Synod Lutherans said no. And she goes on to say in the article, Those shocking statistics from over 10 decades ago demonstrating even then the severe apostasy in the Christian churches most certainly have skyrocketed today. That was 1987. So if people want to know what's the point, who cares, what's the fruit, what's the big deal of Illuminati infiltration, of Luciferian infiltration into the churches, it's exactly what you said, Fritz. It's it's taking these fundamental doctrines, these fundamental truths of Scripture, especially pertaining to the person and ministry of Jesus Christ, and not only watering them down, but defiling them, uh, preaching and presenting an, an, a bastardized version of Scripture. That's the fruit of this, causing people to doubt, as you mentioned, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, causing people to doubt the deity of Jesus. In other words, that he truly was the Son of God, or that he truly was the Messiah. It's gradually breaking down the fundamental backbone of Christianity. That is the prime objective of the infiltration, the Luciferian infiltration. And the next stage of this, which is happening right now, that's been going on for years but the next stage, we've moved into phase two. I think there's three phases. I think phase one is to break down, as I just said, the backbone, the fundamental truths, the foundations of the Christian faith. Number one. Number two, ecumenism or ecumenicalism to fuse all of these different denominations together and then amalgamate them into the Catholic Church. That's phase two. And that doesn't mean that these different denominations are going to come out and say, we reject our denomination, we're Catholic now. That's not what it's going to look like. They're going to gradually, again, as I said earlier, they're going to gradually um, give up some of the fundamental doctrines in order to be a part of this universal movement, this universal movement for the harvesting of souls, for unity, for peace, for safety, that the Catholic Church is leading. The, the, the Pope is the leader of the, of the ecumenical movement. Now, so that's. Jump in here too. Uh, yes, yes. Because not everybody realizes how big the Catholic Church is. The Catholic Church has to be a major pillar in the New World Order because it is the largest Christian denomination worldwide. And, and, and so it, that alone is uh, is why it's going to play a major role. And the other thing that I wanted to bring out, which goes right in, in, along with what you're saying about ecumenicalism being the next step, the second step, in, uh, I think this was in 1989, there was a Christian family. It was a young Catholic family that was very active in Bible studies, and I got the impression that they were on the same wavelength as I was. And so their family and my family went camping together. And on Sunday, we decided to have our own little church service there at, at Fort Stevens Campground. And when we started having that, they explained uh, that uh, what their beliefs were. And I thought that they were Bible-believing Christians, but they were... they they. Uh, th what what he said was is that they had been taught by the Catholic Church that if you are good at whatever you believe in, you will be saved. And I said, whoa, whoa, you mean to tell me that if you're a Luciferian or a Satanist and you're good at being a Luciferian or a Satanist, that you're going to get salvation? I mean, if you're a good Buddhist, you're going to be saved if you're good. if you believe in in Islam and you're good at it you're going to be saved and they said yes that's the way it works so this 
so they could be Christians. They could say, we believe in the Bible, we believe in Christ, but they had this over the, over, over laying over their Christian belief with this ecumenical idea that as long as you were good at what you believed in, you would be saved. And so it, 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 that's the next step, you know. It's, it's yeah, like yeah, that's that, that's actually that actually is the next step because, as I said, the first the 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 uh, infiltration and the bastardizing of the gospel. That's the step one, and that involves everything we broke down, uh, putting into place their ministers, um, causing their guys to rise to power and to be the influential influential movers and shakers in these ministries. That's that's the first part. This, I mean, the first phase. The second phase was ecumenism or ecumenicalism, which is amalgamating all these churches together, all the de- denominations, and and through some compromising of the gospel fusing them with the Catholic Church to a degree. And then the third phase, which is which can be called ecumenicalism, but is better described as the interfaith movement, is a universal religion of all faiths. Or I should say, a universal faith that unites all religions. That is the final and ultimate goal of these guys and of the Luciferian agenda, is to have one religion on this planet that's where the uh, emerging church is taking us because the emerging church their approach is 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 building upon the fact that the schools are are teaching the children that there's no objective truth truth is relative it's objective that might be truth for you but it's not truth for me and and so then the emerging church is saying well, we've got to ask all of these questions and we've got to have all this loosey goosey subjectivity. And so they're taking us exactly where you're saying. And that is, and, and that's exactly what Masonic religion is. In Freemasonry, you can believe that God is whatever you want. I have a Masonic book that says Jesus Christ is come. You know, he's just sperm. Come. And uh, if you want to be a Mason and believe, and you can say, well, I'm a Christian, why you believe that Jesus Christ has come? I mean, that's their their loosey-goosey uh, apost- apostasy that, uh, that the emerging church is developing for us. That's right. That's absolutely right. And it, 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 people may, you know, I just did a, uh, uh, the last analysis I did was on, um, uh, America, the, the the plume land of the plume serpent, uh, entitled Sons of the Dragon, the subtitle Sons of the Dragon, and I find it interesting. And I don't know if you know this, Fritz, but I find it interesting that uh, really, quite literally, this one world religion that they're working towards is going to reinstitute the primal. And when I say primal, I mean the first religion the original religion because of the masons and the theosophists uh and the and basically the masons and the theosophists especially believe that there was a primal religion that there was once a religion that that there was one religion that used to be that was in the in the days of yore that covered the whole earth it's the primal religion of humanity and what is that religion it's the worship of the dragon that's the religion, and isn't it interesting? And 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 I say that because that's what Blavatsky, uh, that's what uh, uh, Madame Blavatsky came out and said, and and many times in her writings. That's what uh, Manly P. Hall has said in his writings. That's what a lot of the modern Theosophists and Masons will will say. Masons don't say it out in the open. They usually say it in their in their pamphlets, like you were saying, in their magazines, and they're not going to come out and broadcast it. But the Theosophists will. The Theosophists and their uh, they'll come out and say these things with boldness. And so why is that interesting? Why is it significant that the, the first religion, humanity's first religion, because relationship with God wasn't religion. That was what man was created for. That's what Adam had in the garden. I'm not referring to relationship with, with, with God the Father. I'm talking about man-made Luciferian religion, the worship of something other than God, it was the worship of the serpent or the dragon. And again, that is confirmed, that notion is confirmed in the occult, in the secret societies, in so many places. I was astounded to discover this. 
And why is that so incredible? Because what does the book of Revelation say? And they worshipped the dragon who gave power to the beast. They worshipped the dragon. That's where this is going. The Luciferians believe and expect, and the Bible confirms, that men will again worship the dragon before this before the end of this age, at the end of this age, before the closing of this age, before Jesus returns. It's literally going to happen. The worship of Lucifer himself, the oldest religion in the world, is coming back, and it's going to be global, and that's what all this is working towards. In fact, I'm doing one more analysis uh, that deals with the, um, uh, um, the plume serpent analysis that deals with that very fact that they're actually trying to reinstitute the worship of Lucifer. And people, people say, well, how could that happen? How in the world can you get, you know, it's one thing to talk about ecumenism or ecumenical, ecumenicalism. It's one thing to talk about interfaith religions. But come on, the worship of Lucifer, the blatant exoteric worship of Lucifer, in other words, out in the open where people are, are worshiping the dragon, how's that going to happen? Who would do that? Why would anybody do that? That's impossible. No, it's not. Because people forget or they just don't realize that part of the plan, part of the Luciferian plan, part of the devil's plan, is to absolutely bring this planet to such a state of darkness and chaos where people are clamoring for peace and safety. And the man that brings that peace and safety, the man that restores or the organization that restores order to this planet will be worshipped. People will, uh, you know, in times of peace and comfort, people may say, well, I'm not going to relinquish my faith. I'm not going to compromise on the gospel. But when the days get dark and when people don't have food and when there's wars and, you know, code red, blood and smoke on the earth, people start to break down because suddenly food and water and safety trump conviction. And they know that. The architects of the collapse understand that. So if they can collapse everything and bring the world to such panic and disarray and then bring in a savior, they know that they can reinstitute Luciferianism as the prime religion on planet Earth. You know, Timothy, That's their goal. the things that you're saying are public information in Alice Bailey's book, Externalization of the Hierarchy. Alice Bailey was in women's branch of Freemasonry. She's Illuminati. She was a theosophist. And in her book, she says that when that they are going to replace the world's religion with Masonic religion. What's Masonic religion? Exactly what we've been talking about here. The power of Lucifer. Remember, I brought out about Albert Pike saying that Lucifer's power, his seething power is the power behind Freemasonry. And she says on the physical level, Lucifer is going to reign. And on the spiritual level, she says that Sana, which is a scrambling of Satan, Satan will be in control. So the, the good side of Satan, Lucifer, will be the side that we see. But actually, it will be Satan ruling on the spiritual side. And it's right there in her books. She was a theosophist, right? Yes. That's what the agenda is. And I, and I know this is, this is going to surprise people. And we can, and we, can uh, we can bring this to a conclusion here, uh, Fritz, um, on this point. Because I think this is, this is really where all of this is going. There, there is a confrontation coming on the planet that people don't really understand. They can't comprehend this confrontation that's coming. And, and give me one second here because I'm bringing up a verse here. I should have this memorized by now. There's a confrontation coming on on planet Earth. It's where all of this is heading. It's why there's a it's why the ecumenical movement is is going forward. It's why the interfaith movement is going forward. It's why the the one world religion is 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 being is uh is 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 being engineered right now as we speak. The one world government and the reason is because there is a supernatural confrontation coming to this planet. It's prophesied in Scripture, and in other words, the faction is being built 
The alliance is being built right now, and it's not an entirely human alliance, is being put together right now to literally make war with God. And we know that that's true because Psalm 2 tells us that that's true. In fact, I'm going to read part of Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Now I'm going to stop and I want people to understand that this is talking about the kings of the earth are getting together they're plotting something. There's a conspiracy afoot in Psalm 2. The rulers of the earth, the nations are raging, and the rulers of the earth are plotting a conspiracy. They're setting themselves against something. What are they doing? I'm going to continue in the verse. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, capital A, against His Son Jesus, now, that's incredible to me. I'm going to pause again here in the verse. That's incredible to me because here you have the nations are raging. The people and the rulers are plotting. They're conspiring a vain thing against the Lord, but not just against the Lord, not just against God in a general way, not just generally against God or a God, but against God and his anointed. In other words, they're plotting a conspiracy against God Almighty and his son, Jesus Christ. What does that tell you? That tells you that these kings of the earth and the people who are raging understand who God is and who his son is. That's what Psalms 2 is telling us. They understand who they're plotting against. They understand who this conspiracy against. They're gathering against God Almighty and Jesus Christ, his son. And they're saying, I'm continuing in the verse, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. What is that? That is, in a nutshell, the Luciferian creed, isn't it? That's the Luciferian creed. That's the Luciferian lie. Because Luciferianism doesn't worship Satan as this ugly demonic entity with horns. They worship Satan as the liberator of mankind. Satan, Lucifer, liberated mankind in the Garden of Eden from the tyrant Adonai. That's what the Luciferians believe. That Satan brought enlightenment and he brought true knowledge to mankind. He was the Prometheus of mankind. He brought the fire from the gods. He enlightened men. He's the fire in men's souls, as some of the writers, Masonic uh, uh, writers refer to. That fire that burns in the, in the hearts of men and the souls of men. Well, that's the Luciferian light that they're referring to. And so this is the Luciferian creed. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So that's, that's Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. So again... What we have here, the nations are raging, the kings of the, of the earth, or you can say the Illuminati, the elite, are taking counsel together. They're plotting, they're conspiring against God Almighty and His Son, Jesus Christ, because they know. They don't deny that Jesus is real. This is important for people to understand. They just have chosen to align themselves with Lucifer. Because Lucifer doesn't deny that Jesus is real, not to his true disciples and acolytes, he tells them that he's the true God and that Adonai is the, uh, is the usurper and the tyrant and is the one who imprisons the minds of men and Satan enlightens the minds of men. That's the Luciferian lie. So that's what we have here. Let us break their bonds in pieces, referring to God and his anointed Jesus. We want to break their bonds. We want to loose ourselves from God Almighty. We don't want Jesus. We reject him out of hand. We don't want the, the king of kings to rule over us. We choose Lucifer. That's really what, what this is, the, the picture this is painting. Well, re continuing on in verse 4, what is God's reply to this? He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And this is what the Lord looks down at them, at the Illuminati, at the, at the ruling elite, at the Luciferian faction, who thinks that they're going to enthrone Lucifer, they're going to enthrone the Antichrist, and by doing so, he's going to give all authority and power to his father, Satan, Lucifer, to rule and reign on the earth. This is what God says to that Luciferian plot. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill, 
of Zion. He's talking about his son, Jesus. God the Father is saying, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. He's laughing at this scheme. He's laughing at this con conspiracy. And he goes on to say in verse 7, this is the Lord. This is his declaration to these conspirators, to these who would set Lucifer as the ruler over the earth. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, this is Jesus now, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, now therefore be wise, O kings. God's again addressing the, the uh, or the writer of the Psalms is addressing the kings of the earth. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, the Son of God, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. So, in other words, Psalm 2 is setting the stage. It's showing us, it's, it's showing us this conflict, this confrontation that is coming on planet Earth. And the insight that Psalm 2 gives us is incredible because here's my question Fritz this is what I ask people all the time when when reviewing Psalm 2 what kind of weapons do you bring to a war with God the kings of the earth are conspiring they're gathering together they're going to make war with God well my question is and, and I want people to think of this in terms of the Illuminati the one world government the one world religion the Luciferian faction what kind of weapons are they bringing or who do they have in their ranks or who are they following that is giving them the confidence that they could actually make war with God that's where this is going the one world religion the one world government the enthronement of Antichrist the worship of the dragon is going to lead the earth literally in a conflict with God Almighty and with Jesus Christ and and this this should, and, and obviously the Lord laughs. This isn't a this isn't a real threat to God. He laughs at that at this conspiracy. He holds them in derision. Nevertheless, nevertheless, woe to those pastors and ministers and leaders of Christian organizations who align themselves with the Luciferian conspiracy, with the Illuminati. With the, with the ruling elite who are compromising the gospel in order to participate in the universal faith, first the universal faith of quote unquote Christianity, and then the final phase, the interfaith movement, by the way, which will, which will have Jesus included. They'll include Jesus to satisfy the Christians, but they'll deny, as you said, the virgin birth and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where this is heading. That's the, that is the, the final phase of all of this. And I wanted to say that, uh, just to put this, what we're talking about, uh, today into perspective for everybody, it couldn't be more serious. This isn't a side issue. This isn't a peripheral issue. This isn't perfunctory information. This, these are the days in which we live and people have got to have discernment. We've got to discern the plot of the ruling elite because it is the Luciferian faction. It is, it is a, it is a conspiracy that has not only been hatched in darkness, it's a conspiracy that's been, that's been under development since since Adam was in the Garden of Eden. It's a conspiracy that was developed first and foremost by the minds of fallen angels, the ones who are carrying it out, the, the ones who are carrying out the orders, the Illuminati, the ruling elite, uh, the, the, the sons of the dragon, whatever you want to call them, they are simply taking orders from the real hierarchy that exists, the true brotherhood of darkness, which is the devil himself, and all of the fallen angels and the non-human faction that's governing the human faction. Well, you were asking what weapon do they use in this kind of warfare? If we look at what uh, Lucifer used in the garden, it was deception. And uh, that's one of the big tools that they have. That ties in with the word esoteric or arcane or occult. 
All three of those words mean hidden knowledge. And you use deception in the occult. You have, you have your front view. Oh, I'm, this man is a good minister. And then behind that is the occult reality. And so they're using deception. They're, they're saying, okay, we've got this movement, a uh, Christian movement. We've got this Christian denomination. We've got this Christian program, but they're deceptions. And that's what we've been talking about today is, is, are, are, are these deceptions. Fritz Springmeier, I appreciate your, your candidness. I appreciate your, your, your willingness to address this subject because frankly, you know as well as I do, not many people want to touch this subject. A lot of people will talk about the Illuminati. A lot of people will talk about the ruling elite. A lot of people will talk about the Federal Reserve and the central banks. But not many people are willing to touch the issue of the infiltration into these churches, into the fallacy of these ministries, and into the corruption and that cancer that we talked about in the body of Christ. So thank you for your courage. Thank you for your willingness to, to deal with this subject. Thank you for a platform where I could discuss these things. Uh, thank you, Timothy. I appreciate being on the show today.